You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Chris Dalton. Chris is Associate Professor of Management Learning and Model Convener for Personal Development at Henley Business School. Chris has over 28 years of experience in management, education, and training, and today we'll be discussing his book, MBA Day by Day, Turn World-Class Thinking into Everyday Business Brilliance. That's a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? It is, yeah. Pleasure to have you on. Hi, thanks very much, Sean. So like we were mentioning briefly before uh, we started recording, I had found out about you through my mum who studied at Henley Business School. She was very excited to have you on because she she learned a lot through you and I was excited to read the book and I'm excited to talk about MBAs and, and, uh, and get a bit more of an insight into it. So before we delve into the, let's say, weeds of what it is to, to have an MBA, you started off the book uh, with, a, with a quote, which I thought was great. It says, the key to thoughtful action lies in self-awareness. And I wanted just to delve a bit more into that quote or into the idea of self-awareness and how more people can employ self-awareness into business more specifically. I think probably self-awareness is, is the thread that runs, not, not actually not just through this book. I mean, the book is written from the point of view of improving yourself as a manager or as a leader but doing so from the inside out so there's a of course and typically on an mba or in 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 lots of different training situations there's a lot of knowledge that people gain and then they transfer that knowledge into a skill and then they get experience from the skill but really what makes the difference i think for someone who is looking at their career in the long term so when you really start to put pieces together and you get outside the, the day-to-day and you're, you look beyond the task and beyond the job and start to look at the shape of the whole thing as it relates to you in life. I think most people who have traveled that journey appreciate the importance of awareness in doing so. And I, you, you raised this as a question anyway beforehand. And I, it, of course, being a reflective subject, I've been reflecting on this one myself. I, I think that we use the word awareness quite a lot uh, in learning, and people people are, are happy with with understanding intellectually that awareness is an important thing and reflection is an important thing. And most people, I think, there's two ways of looking at it, and the first way is as a conscious decision. So. I'm going to make myself aware. I'm going to practice awareness and I'm going to be, I'm going to bring it to mind. And I think there's lots of ways and techniques that, that people use to do this when they, when they want to learn something Mm. um, all the way from uh, sitting down and concentrating on a subject to mindfulness practice and that sort of thing. But the idea is awareness is something you're, consciously aware of but i don't think that's what awareness is actually i I think awareness is having no barrier no filter between you and the world around you being really in the moment because most people most of the time when they're engaged in something fully Mm. they're not thinking about being engaged with that thing fully they just they just are and they're very uh, open to all of the clues and the data and the stimulus around them, and they're, they're, they're living it. So I think awareness is the most useful definition of awareness for someone who is a manager or a leader is to find a way to, to remove the barriers between them and the world around them, just to live it and not, have, and not to have to think about it too much, maybe at the beginning because you're kind of training yourself to, to uh, uh, observe in yourself the filters you're using or the conditioning that you have. And we all bring that in. Mm. We all have that from different parts of our lives. 
Yeah, so <laughs> I don't know if that helps or not, but uh... it's so it's a move more from awareness. <laughs> I see it as more of a definition change. It's more awareness as a whole to maybe present awareness, being being more present in a, an activity or in a a challenge. If you're a manage a manager or a leader, it's more taking all taking in all the information, taking in all the data, being aware to the situation, and not thinking, for instance, five ten years what that might be like and the, and the consequences of of such. Well, well, but taking uh, that into consideration, obviously, but yeah, it's 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 acting in the world without necessarily having to think about how you're acting in the world. You're just going with the way that thing with thing that with, uh, going with things the way where they are, and that means that you are less rigid. And I, I think a, a problem is that people have a restriction in their ability to to manage or to 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 manage themselves upwards in their careers because they're too rigid. And the, the first thought you have is, well, I have to become more qualified. I have to know more stuff. I have to be able to answer question X with answer Y. And I'm not so sure that that's actually really what makes the difference. I think the people who you see really enjoying themselves in their careers really know themselves from the point of view of going with the way the world is. And that, I think, somehow that is getting closer to after 10 years of talking about awareness with MBA students. I, I think that's kind of closer to the definition. Do you think a lot of MBA students have done that exercise of why they're doing the MBA or why they're going down that road prior to joining or is part of your training no. or part of your course actually enlightening people to the reasons why they've done it? Yeah, you're, that's it. We spend quite a lot of time, especially at the start of the MBA program, mm -hmm. kind of interrupting people's flow of thoughts and getting them to look at their story and see what assumptions they've made. People have many reasons for doing an MBA program, ranging from the, the highly pragmatic, practical to the more esoteric mysterious and everything in between and a lot of it is is to do with understanding themselves but they don't know that at the beginning no i mm. would say that's that's fair and my guess is 20 percent of the people on the course will not get it until much much later on mm. um, until they start having a look at some of the subjects and then they, they, well until they... after they graduate sometimes <laughs> Seriously. And, and how, how long is it from start to finish? I think it'd be good if you now just introduce perhaps what an MBA is technically and, and what yeah. the purpose of it is. Well, I work at Henley Business School and Henley exclusively now, Henley does what uh, part-time MBA programs. So everybody who's studying with us, um, and we've got about 3,000 students around the world in six different locations. They're all working managers. They're all practicing managers. So they're doing what we call an executive MBA. And an executive MBA typically takes between two and three years. Typically also people will be average age anywhere between 35 to 40 years old when they start. So they're bringing in a huge amount of experience. And that experience is really critically important for what happens in the classroom because it isn't just a transmission and testing of, of um, models frameworks and theories to see whether or not you you know them it's uh, the art of finding insights from your experience seen through these models and frameworks that you will then ap apply or or practice with back at work so that the cycle of learning with an executive mba is always practical and it's perhaps a little bit different from a younger MBA program and a lot of full-time MBA programs of one or two years in length. They, they're taking on people who are a lot younger than that and they don't, have, they don't have the management experience. So they're more theoretical. They're more you know, sort of ideals rather than war stories. Do you feel that practical application is very important before you head yeah. into that, that program? I do, yes. How, sure how is <laughs> How has the program changed then in, in your study? Not not perhaps when you started teaching it, but how has the actual program changed since its inception to the time that it is now, yeah. given the change in business and technology? How has how that program changed? In some ways, uh, not much at all. Um, 
uh, the, the MBA program has a long history as an idea. I mean, the, the pioneer MBA programs from the United States, more or less the beginning of the 20th century. What we would, what most people would meet now if they were to inquire into or to join an MBA program would be a model that is really from the 1960s and 1970s onward. I think that would be the establishment of the, the basic structure of, of, of breaking things down into typical subject module areas that have uh, they endure quite a lot the delivery of that has not changed radically even with the the year we've had with covid and the pandemic and and everything switching and pivoting online there have always been other models of how to deliver this uh, distance learning for example is one of those hmm. um, but they're not the mainstream the mainstream seems to be still the desire amongst working managers to have the luxury really of time to stop and think and time with colleagues to network and to exchange experiences and thoughts about the learning and time also to apply what they're picking up back at work in projects and those three elements I think are pretty core to the idea of how to structure an MBA program. I think younger people will be looking at MBA for different reasons. They're looking at it more in terms of a, a boost to career. Mm. But executive MBAs are not about promotion. Not really. They're not about salaries even. Is it more from, from what you've described, it's more about perhaps a mix between, like you said, trading war stories and with, with others and the network function, but also the fact that they have a chance to perhaps reflect on the 10 to 15, even 20 years experience they might have had yeah. in the field and see whether that's something that they want to pursue for the rest of their, for the rest of their career or whether they want to pivot to something else. It seems yeah. like it's a, a self-reflection going back to the first it point, is. self-reflective exercise. Yeah. And that's a surprise for a lot of people on, on the course when they meet how reflective the whole process is, they're often really genuinely surprised at, Sometimes I think they're surprised at the gap present in their own careers between what they're doing and what they actually really would like to do. Yeah. And sometimes they're um, struck, I think, by the gap between whether or not they think they're as good as everybody else thinks they are. Mm. So people get promoted. So we're dealing with people who are mid, sometimes senior level management, and they've had they've had promotions, they've had success, they're good at what they do. Um, but the imposter syndrome is perhaps the most pervasive of all um, of, of all sort of thought processes at the start of an exec MBA. Yeah, and you're right that, that the personal development then is, is welcomed. Really, it's welcomed because it's uh, forcing them into the position where they, they need to contemplate their story a little bit. Um, critically also sometimes mm. in terms of, of change. How, how many of those individuals actually drop out of their career? So to say they do the MBA, they finish their MBA, then they realize, oh, I actually want to go actually do pottery because that's what I actually wanted to do. <laughs> how, how, how many people actually continue? Or oh, you must have like what people are doing five years, 10 years after the course uh, as information at the, at the business school. How many people sort of continue down the same line? How many pivot? No, I wouldn't say many people drop out like you've just described, you know, okay. kind of that, the rat race thing. The, the, there are a lot of people who make a change which would not have been the change they thought would be the change before the MBA. I see. Okay. So you're, you know, this, you're right. This idea of uh, the ladder, they're still going up or they're still going outward. So in fact, there's an acceleration, especially of the outward. But what they're doing is they're finding their feet in, in a business area. Usually it's a business area that, that is closely or more, more closely connected to really what interests them, but also an area that they can actually have impact in, so be effective in, be productive in. So you've got this, you've got this balance between I want to do something that I feel drawn towards, but it also has to be something that is going to have a positive impact on the world. And we see a lot of that. We see a lot of people who usually not immediately after graduation, it's, there's, it's often the, 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 the first or the second or even the third hop into something they've chosen because it suits them 
and because they know it's going to do some good. Yeah. Is that is that often through their reflection or is it through network? Because I would have thought during that program, you would have had the opportunity to meet a lot of people from different industries. And then perhaps there might be an industry that you never knew even existed. And you thought, to yourself, ah, actually, that sounds really interesting. And then you develop a network and then you can speak with others. It's possible. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be the most common thing, but it would certainly be possible that you would make a link with someone that you had met in an, in an industry you hadn't thought about and have discovered accidentally to have discovered your passion. More, the most common thing would be that people connect or reconnect with what they were really, really passionate about at an earlier point in their lives. Strangely enough, it's often the thing that you were obsessed with when you were 18 or 19. There's some element of it. You're obviously not the same thing, but there's usually a thread. There's usually a connection to something I've always wanted to do. One of one of the questions I had written in relation to the people that actually join the program, what industries are they usually from? Is it a, a vast range of industries or are you finding more and more there's patterns for the type of uh, individuals that come from diff- from the same types of industries that come and do an MBA program? Well, we've had all sorts. Obviously, you would expect people from multinational, international companies and IT would be a typical one. Pharmaceuticals would be another. Less so FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, because for various reasons, people don't usually do them. There are some industries where people just don't do MBAs. And there are others where they do. And so where they do, we, we, we get those. Why, but we, why, do you, why do you think that is? Typically because like the hotel, restaurant and catering industry, for example, but also some fast moving consumer goods companies, these are organizations that like to train people up completely from inside. And the whole point is that you learn the ropes and the structure of the organization is designed to lead somebody on a management track without the necessity to go out and get a degree like like an MBA, which is rather too generalist. So the MBA is, is a generalist degree and in some industries that, that's not particularly valuable. In other industries, of course, especially and also uh, small to medium sized enterprises, SMEs, a lot of people will gain a lot from doing an MBA there. We at, at, at Henley in the UK, it's interesting because we, we also get people from the army and the Ministry of Defense. We get people from the third sector and the charities, in addition to all of the, the sort of the usual suspects. And they really do. Add, and also the music and creative industry as well. Uh, the last uh, 10 or 15 years and they add a lot they add a lot to uh, what's going on inside the classroom yeah but it actually is is a little bit difficult to predict where people are in general where people are going to be coming from i guess it's as people perhaps move away to more i don't know perhaps small organizations or perhaps when they start working for themselves more i think perhaps difficult to predict where the, where the individuals are going to come from because if you think of like a large like you said a corporation or multinational corporation you're more likely that those people for their mba program are going to come from there rather than someone perhaps who is in an sme that is slightly on the smaller end rather than a bigger end of an sme depends where we we have a very big program in south africa and um, the, it's the nature of the economy there also that there are fewer larger organizations and more smaller organizations and it's more fragmented for fragmented um and also the the public sector is larger there so you'll it gets skewed that way yeah you, you pick up what the local market is is going to have available what it needs and it almost doesn't matter actually i think what matters more is is the profile of somebody where they are in their career and, and, and in, in what way are they feeling held back? In what way is there stuckness in career terms? Because especially from, from my perspective, from the personal development perspective, that's, what, that's really what we're interested in. We're interested in the person, I think, less, less so than necessarily the, the, the function they play or the industry they're in. What prerequisites do you look for then? As uh, in the individual, what profile do you look for? Well, okay, as as someone who is uh, sort of the head of personal development, or personal development is your is your area. What do you? What characteristics do you look for in someone that enables you to teach them in the best way possible? Curiosity. That's if if, if they're bringing in an open mind, as few expectations as possible. Just the the willingness to be surprised, the willingness to be engaged, the willingness to go with it 
go with the conversation. Some ability, I think, to be a little bit open with themselves, be honest with themselves. And that takes a, a certain amount of facilitation to create a trusting environment so where, where we can run a workshop with a group of, of managers and um, they've got the freedom to, to be honest and open with each other. Those, those, are, those I'd say would be the only prerequisites. Otherwise, we, we just work, I just work with what's in the room. Mm. With who's in the room yeah. because the, the thing with a, with someone like that is if they're not getting something out of the process then they won't show up that's yeah, exactly. the test <laughs> it feels like as the expectation point of view is probably one that is quite difficult for you to deal with if someone's expecting sort of a, a wholesale turnaround especially in a short period of time managing their expectations might be a bit difficult i, I don't manage their expectations that's they, they're there how can i do that i mean that well, just you, you might have to teach up their expectations or facilitate them for, for that I'm sure you come across some individuals perhaps who are a bit that yeah, stuff. Yeah, but I, I take that as, as a good sign. I take that as something to work with when someone's sort of railing against it a little bit and, you know, pushing back. I, I like the pushback, okay. not, because, not because I have to defeat them, but because it's, it's, it's information. It's information to work with. It's definitely information for them. So the same process, the same inquiry process, you just turn the energy around on, 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 on to that. But they come out of it, either way, they come out of it a little bit better equipped to look at the world around them in, in this way of awareness that we were talking about at the beginning. Mm. So to inquire of the world around you, you can't insert between you and the world judgment. You can't, it doesn't work. All these filters that we, that we carry where we've prejudged the environment. Well, that's that in business, that's fatal. Wishful thinking as a manager as to what the context should be or even what the context is. The context doesn't care. I mean, that's the beauty of reality. The context is context and it will, it will have you for breakfast. You can't, have a, you can't win an argument with reality. So how do, you see, how do you see reality that way? And really that's the model for turned in on, on the idea of yourself as a manager. How do you see yourself in reality? It, that sounds really fluffy, doesn't it? I know that sounds like... <laughs> I would get into like a, a conversation on consciousness, I feel like, after, after that. What is consciousness? What is perspective? Objective yeah. versus subjective. But it's interesting that you say that because I think that a lot of people would have this stern look at what an MBA is. A very technical qualification, people in suits, consulting companies. Those are the type of individuals that do an MBA. But from reading the book and from speaking to you right now, it seems like it's very much more of a reflective or the way that you do it over at Henley Business School is more reflective and it's more what can that individual learn about themselves in order to affect the world around them yeah well first of all I think there aren't many MBA programs that wouldn't want to say that whether or not they do that is is is, is another question because there's a big continuum of different schools with different traditions and different values and so on and so forth sure it is the it is true that the, that the tradition at Henley has very much been conversational. It's been dialogue. Let's process experience in a way that is useful from the point of view of the organization. That is very much what the school has always done. We're not the only school that, 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 that uh, has that tradition. Uh, it's, it's rather a European tradition in terms of education, I think. And it's also a tradition that's really was created, first of all, in partnership with industry. And maybe that's another clue. If you, if you are someone who is fast track, ambitious, looking to work for a big consulting company, looking for a, to expand in a technical area, there are MBA programs that you, that you could do and they will deliver something of that for you. I don't think those programs quite get the idea of, of being more reflective about doing it, but I don't know. I could be wrong. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's the stipulation you made earlier between perhaps the executive MBA program, which is for those of perhaps a slightly older age and more experience yeah, possibly. and those who are, are, are more for sort of fast track. So it's not perhaps one is better than the other. You're not pitting one against the other. They're just for two different contexts. That's true. But I, I agree with Henry Mintzberg when he was critiquing younger MBA programs, that they've kind of got things um, the wrong way around. Uh, an MBA is something you really should put off as long as you possibly can, precisely because you get back from it what you put in. And since it's about general management, really, 
if you've had no general management experience, all you're doing is processing other people's thoughts about it. And you might be very clever at doing that, but it won't help you. It really won't help you once you get back out post-graduation into a world where you, you, you can't fake it. You, you can't jump the fact that you need to learn things the hard way. Learn them intelligently, mm. but you, you, you can't shortcut time <laughs> experience yeah 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 definitely. and you can get a lot of great experience in a short amount of time i think um, depending on the, the context and the situation there are people who have been through a lot by the time they're 28 and um of course there are exceptions but by and large moving from undergraduates to graduates to an mba with almost no work experience i don't see the point i don't mm. think it's a good investment of time and money because what are you working with other than the textbook? What are you working with? Mm. And case studies. And case studies. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, if you're doing part time, if you're studying part time, you're living your case studies. And, and so are your classmates. And they're all different cases, if you want to look at it that way. So is your personal recommendation or the way that you see an MBA program more for that individual then who's a bit older? So if someone does come to you or someone is listening to this and is perhaps... 27 to 30 and had perhaps five years experience would you sort of deter them from doing the MBA program or would you give them sort of a recommendation to perhaps delay it until they have a bit more experience I I, I would ask them to ask the programs they're interested in how they would deal with this particular question mm -hmm. I wouldn't dictate to somebody that they should wait you have to it has to be your own decision but i do know i have spoken to people who have been through mba programs younger and they've got another eight ten years after that and the thing that they say invariably is is that they can see how waiting would have helped them mm more and they're grateful for what the school did for them it was a very engaging period of their lives they got the same feeling of intake and cohort and camaraderie and all of those things they, they, you can have all of that um, but the thing it couldn't do for them was be the shortcut it couldn't short circuit the necessity to have failed at things in a managerial capacity and to to have learned from those failures and then and then to apply that learning back into a, a more formal step of learning. I think that's personally, um, I think I think it would be better to, for people to wait until at least they're in their 30s before doing an MBA. Seems like the reasons or the justifications for that seem seem all valid based on experience. And then your your ability to reflect on the experiences you had, look at back at what you could have done better and then perhaps apply that going going forward. Talking it's partly it's partly that, but actually I think it's how do you react to the world as you meet it. So this isn't about uh, being really, really good at processing past experiences. This is about having more choice as you, as you meet the world in the present. And the fact is, the higher up you go in the organization, the more the world that you're meeting is strategic and it's relational and it's unpredictable and it's complex. You're better equipped uh, later in, in life to, to study that. And to be prepared as a as a as a person, a manager, as a leader, or whatever, is that from strategic thinking, or is that from the understanding of how you act in that situation, or is it a combination of both? Probably a combination. Yeah, that seems that seems like a seems like a valid way to to look at it. To be fair, um, talking about the book a, a bit more technically, you, you, towards the end of the book, you started talking about the difference between a manager and a leader. I thought that was a very interesting distinction that you made. Could you just speak to that a bit? How would you define a difference between a manager and a leader? Everyone's favorite question, isn't it? Usually let's transfer, let's make a list on this side. Let's make a list on that oh, is side. That, is that what you do in your, in your seminars? We do, but we have a twist. Okay. <laughs> so, so <laughs> we, we're looking at it. We're, we, we make them make the list in order for them to then critique that approach of lists. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, so. I like that. We, we use it we use it as an excuse for critical thinking because we ask them then to, to say, where did your ideas come from? And once you begin to think about where, where does my definition come from rather than what is my definition, where did it come from? That's more valuable and more useful because that skill, that underlying skill of questioning the world around you is, is more useful than this idea of always having the right answer. 
they've got all the clever answer or that sort of thing. However, if I was to come up with a clever answer, <laughs> I would say the fundamental difference, and sometimes there's no difference. I mean, it's a, it's a made up distinction, but the clearest points at which the word leader has meaning that is not a huge overlap with, with manager is in the sense that the leader is interested in that which is not yet here. The manager is interested primarily in getting the squeezing the most out of the current situation, managing the processes to the, to the optimum way, making sure that resources you might need to do what you're doing in the future are uh, going to be available and are managed in the right way. And the resources can be money, it can be processes, it can be people. So all of that, all that way of just doing what we're doing into the future, obviously, but doing what we're doing in the best way possible. Whereas leadership is sometimes the jump away from all of that, the hop out into something that we're not doing. And, and if we carried on doing what we're doing, we won't be doing that. <laughs> it's not something that's just going to happen. There needs to be an intervention. And I think the combination of what is absent and the need for an intervention those two things are characteristic of, of leadership, the vision and the, the call. Let's do something about it. This is the problem. Let's do something about it. That feels like it's a useful definition of, of, of leadership. But the, the closer you look at it, the closer you examine these things, the more you find that actually all of your definitions start to break down mm. or things are more nuanced than that because we use the word leader very easily just to describe a hierarchy. We all do, you know, take me to your leader. Doesn't mean take me to the person who's dreaming up the next vision. It just, who's the person in charge. Mm. So language is, can also be a barrier. But if you were to ask me, what's the di di difference? <laughs> it's that. <laughs> it seems to me from our conversation so far is that there are these definitions in the business context or in the management context that people like to use. But it seems as if your take on it is that the technical definitions don't matter so much as the intention or the thought process that it is given to get to that situation. Yes. That definition. Understanding the definition is, is the key to being able to use it, not in a novel way, not just, you know, imitation, but actually to be original about something. Yeah. So the book actually... On one level, the book just presents all of the MBA areas. It just goes through them one by one and, and gives an overview and a summary of, of each of these typical business silos like marketing or finance or whatever it is. <clears throat> but at the same time, all the time, it's holding back from endorsing any of that and saying, well, think about that there's that view and then there's also this view mm. think about how these two views can exist can they coexist together or not so it's always with this questioning mindset and that's the mindset that comes out of well i think it comes out of the pd but there are other parts of the mba program that are full of questions too do you feel like the only way to deepen understanding like you just said is to ask yourself the right questions because i think there's a difference between asking yourself questions and asking yourself the right questions do you do we you think say, there's uh, well, we say better questions. That's yeah. That's a, that's a better question to ask, <laughs> rather than the right questions. The better questions, yeah. Yeah, I. The problem with saying the right question is you're presupposing uh, there is one. Yes. Um, yes. That's and, true. and there are lots of right questions, depending on your point of view. There are lots of right questions, and you can take a position on something, look at it from an angle, and someone else can take. A different position on the same thing look at it from another angle they'll, they'll they'll create different questions from that angle it's the right question is it a better question or not that's a process that presumably you can then start to test critically mm -hmm. so how would we go about finding out if this is a better question or not and uh, very often with personal development the better question is the one that you you makes you stop you can't answer it you go, and that gets people really annoyed. Yeah. 
uh, especially managers who are problem solvers. This is the biggest disease they bring in is this, this talent for solving problems. And then they come into an, this academic environment where they're, they're kind of pushed back on that a little bit saying, whoa, whoa, hang on. How do you set the problem in the first place? Hmm. Not how do you solve it, but how was this problem set? And that matters. And it brings us back to this question of leadership too. It matters because the context within which all of these organizations, and we tend to focus, we tend to focus our thoughts around business, around the idea of the organization. That's kind of the basic unit, which contains lots of individual people. How the organization interrelates with its environment, with its context. That's the tricky part. Uh, that you, you can't, it's not a question of problem solving of fixing things you'll never fix it what you will do is understand it better and with greater understanding comes more flexibility and with more flexibility becomes more of a chance of of, of operating sustainably in that environment because you're not you're not destroying the environment all the time so it's a move to switch mindset because it seems like it's more of a mindset thing a mindset away from solving to understanding yeah that's fair and then with with the understanding comes the solving it's sort of you get with understanding you get both possibly solving, solving you only get sometimes one. it's dissolving because you realize that the the problem wasn't a it wasn't a problem at all or it's not that that's not the problem something else is could you give an example well one possible example is what's happening in the fossil fuel industry right now if you look at a lot of the big conglomerate international oil flowing through their veins oil companies for a long time i think they felt under pressure to remain viable organizations profitable organizations by promoting the uh, an existing business model for as, as much as possible for as long as possible so finding ways in which they could yeah become greener so you no know, do what they do without damaging the environment, but not to shake the basic premise of uh, we are an organization that extracts fossil fuels, we extract carbon. And that's, that's the business that we're in, which is a huge presupposition. And then if every situation you meet that seems to block you is a problem to be solved but you're coming at it only from that direction and i think now we're beginning to see right now at the top at the heads of some of these organizations there is perhaps a shift happening which says uh, have we defined what we do correctly have we def do we have to define ourselves as being that is there a for example is there a business which is the business of keeping keeping this stuff in the ground and yet also remaining a viable, profitable, sustainable business because we've, we've redefined what we do as energy, not as, as oil. Energy is, is something that you can find in, so we are a, a company that's good at finding energy. So they keep, they keep that element to the, of themselves and they simply, well, where else can we find energy? And then we, then we move in that direction. So what you, what, you, what you see there is sort of dissolving the old problem rather than solving the old problem. It's not something we've solved. We've just, we've just gone back to some fundamentals and using those fundamentals, we are now looking at the environment as a total. And that is a massive strategic shift that I, I really hope that's what's happening with these with these organizations but that's what they're talking about and that's what the leaders of of a lot of econ economic units like the world economic forum that's the that's the big topic of conversation right now it seems like from an individual and an organ organizational point of view a move back to first principles if we're going to use a scientific method is a is a thing that they need to do on a regular basis because by by returning to first principles from a scientific point of view you're enhancing your understanding of the actual uh, key elements of of what you're trying to do but even then you you need to be asking yourselves all the time whether those principles are hold valid or not but yes yeah keeping it basic it's always good to ask yourself what business are we in so what do you do when those definitions change or let's say the understanding perhaps changes due to a, a level of perhaps technology or 
how how does one leader slash manager go about asking better questions in a, an environment that is perhaps a bit more subject to change? Well, they do an MBA. <laughs> well, they read the book. How do they do it? They, they take the time out to, uh, yeah, and maybe they need to find a bit of structure to do this because people's, people have a, we have a chronic issue with making people be busy. Mm. Um, the, the equation right now is if, if I, right now it's if I'm not sitting in front of a Zoom screen, I'm, I'm not at work, which is crazy. People's lives are, are being sucked into the platform of communication that the pandemic has put us all into. And it's, there's lots of things that are very useful about that. But at the same time, maybe we've missed, we've missed the opportunity here to be quiet as mm-hmm. well. There hasn't been much, amazingly, there hasn't been much quiet time in the last 12 months, has there? <laughs> we've all needed to be as interconnected as possible fair enough but if it's a question of getting back to basics and re-examining those if this is an op- if this is going to be an opportunity then there needs to be space to do that and actually when we do the workshops at henley with the pd so we have four one day workshops in in the life of the program they are often seen by the participants as oacs of something slightly different it's a chance to to, to sort of self-examine but but actually it's a it, it's a quiet time what's an oac an oasis oh an oasis i'm oh, sorry yeah. said an oac i thought you thought i was like a no. <laughs> uh, yes how do how do managers and leaders go about doing that when they're running their busy companies if they obviously if they aren't already on your program yeah i don't know Short answer. I, I mean, uh, people make steps in those directions, but they're often the, they're often the, the the so a lot of people who are running organisations are very very aware that they need to give others time, and they'll say to the staff, you know, don't work after seven o'clock or six o'clock, and no emails after nine o'clock or whatever it is, and then they're the ones who are sending things out because they're they're the ones putting the pressure on themselves they don't practice what they preach there's a lot of goodwill in organizations at the top Um, i think people are very conscious now of of health and well-being more conscious than they were but they've got to live it themselves one thing i wanted to talk about was this idea of like last week i had someone come on the podcast and he wrote a book on race and colonialism on the economic system. And I'm not going to ask you about that. But one thing I wanted to ask you was from a management perspective and from a PD perspective, you are talking to individuals who are part of a economic system that is known as capitalism. And we've seen over the past, I want to say 100 years, many, many situations of perhaps crony capitalism and and people exploiting the system. And I know in the book, you gave some examples as well. How can managers and leaders work in a system that perhaps favors these uh, better practices? How can people perhaps doing an MBA or going about achieving an MBA do so with a more corporate responsibility headline rather than an exploitation point of view? Really important question, actually. Um, I think personally, I think it ought to be one of the fundamental functions of a business school that it it is constantly examining and re-examining this question not just within its curriculum but also promoting this more widely and different schools do in the mba world different schools do this in different ways some will have a a, like eight there'll be a course you take or have to take and might be one that's quite early on especially if it's younger students Um, others will say it's 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 really an edge that we look at in, in lots of subjects all along the way. And then other schools promote actively programs that are inclusive, that are targeting particular um, segments of, of not just of in, in economy, but also of society. And actually, a good example of good practice in this area is Henley in, in South Africa, Henley Africa, which has a very strong mission and drive, not just to provide corporate training and education, or, or, or even um, you know MBA programs, but a whole set of management and and business and and particularly around fairer society. There's a whole lot of things that they're doing down there because the ability 
both the ability to to put things like that on is easier than it is here because we're all so cynical but there's no cynicism over in in south africa it's really amazing but so the but so the issue is also much higher you know this endemic corruption mm. um is in in many african countries it's, it's just so much to be done i can't really answer the how but i can totally agree with the sentiment of asking asking the question and i completely agree with it i can't do anything more myself other than try to facilitate and model what i think is a an open and balanced approach to self-examination with the understanding that that's our definition of personal development anyway is that it starts with you always has to but it never stops with you because there is a concentric number of rings around you um, through your organization out into the industry out into the economy out into the society out into you know, eventually you end up with the biosphere so all of it is interconnected and all of it matters and all of it has influences both ways but obviously the one that you live is is the one which is which is centered on you so mm. yeah that's where we have to start but you can't tell people either you can't you can't tell them what to do that was that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you because obviously when when people come to the school they're obviously doing so willingly or I, I hope they're doing it so willingly uh, that they're not being forced there. So we do ask them actually at the start. Oh, do you? We do. Yeah. Uh, Just... Do you get anyone who says they come here out of their own? <laughs> no. No. Not on our not on our course. But okay, we, good. We we make them put their hands up. Okay. The reason okay. and the reason we ask them to, to raise their hands <laughs> that you're here willingly, your own accord. Is because it's a really difficult course to stick to and people have to every time they get stuck they should remember that they're, they're here because they've chosen to do this it's quite important it's this commitment element and maybe if you were doing a corporate training maybe if you were just sent by your company uh, you wouldn't have the same investment i don't know but I mean, actually i have been on some and i haven't had the same investment <laughs> that is well true. there you go so you go i have so first-hand experience because we play around with their heads so much on the MBA program that we kind of need, we kind of need to have this as a get out clause. You know, you did ask for this, <laughs> you know, nobody sent you here. So, you know, and it's important, I think that we, we are honest with them out front about that. What are some of the difficulties that students come to you with? What are the, some of the challenges they face? I think it would be good for individuals perhaps who are looking to do an MBA, know some of the potential challenges uh, ahead of time. Of, of being a student on a course like like ours, doing a, a part-time program. Mm. Undoubtedly, the biggest one is how do you balance doing this in a, in a life that's full of imbalances already? How do you manage a big chunk of commitment that is, it's quite selfish because in terms of your organization and it's certainly in terms of your family, I mean, you've experienced a bit of this. It's, it's pretty intense yeah it, it's for that person it's very intense and the intensity doesn't stop all the way through the program but of course everybody around them after six weeks two months three months you kind of you've, you're over it <laughs> it's like are you still doing this <laughs> so for the for that person it is managing to keep alive all of the things that sustain them in the environment and and really the key to that is 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 the social network around them and how do they, I suppose, how they manage their time. But I always think time management is a myth. I mean, it's, it's not the issue. It's a symptom, not the cause. When people say, I, I need to fix my time management, there's usually something else. Uh, it's prioritization, it. usually, not more than a management of time, I think it's a prioritization. Would you agree? Well, yes, except what do you base the prior prioritization on if it's mm. not something else? It's well, not simply prior prioritizing. I mean, the way I see it from, because I, I read a lot of product, I'm big into my productivity and I do like, I, I read lots of books on productivity. I love it. It's just my hobby. <laughs> it's one of those things for me, it's the system's good. The system's important for the way you go about prioritizing your time. But I, I almost think going back to the essence of what you're trying to do is if if you don't hold it as a priority in your life, you're not going to do it regardless of how well you you time you time manage so it doesn't matter how well you time block yeah. it doesn't matter how how good you are at getting into the calendar if you don't want to do it then you're not going to do it um if it's not a priority to you yeah 
and what I hear you say is is that the the priorities connected to motivation. Yeah, it, it's purpose essentially. Like yeah. I, I the other day I, I put out something. Uh, I read the book called Ego is the Enemy of Our Run Holiday. And I put, this was a couple of years back, I read the book and I was rereading the other day and I put out a video on my social channels and I did like a five principles video. And in that book, he talks about find a purpose, not a passion. So it's like, don't be passionate, have a purpose. And I got so many people messaging me saying, oh, it's bad that you're telling people not to be passionate. You know, I'm passionate about doing my my course, my doctor, she was becoming a doctor. And I'm like, no, you're doing your doctorate because you it's it's purpose. You find purpose in that you don't find passion in it if you found passion in it you would have stopped it by now it's because you find purpose in it so i think that purpose element is important rather than passion i don't really like that word passion so for you purpose is uh, about output outcome objectives i would say a step higher it's more value like what value is it giving what values how does it link to your intrinsic value like for instance speaking with you now doing this podcast that I do, it's not so much a, it's a value for me to share insights from people who have expertise in their field to audiences. So the, the, the purpose or the value is the, the, the values I hold dear in education, open discussion, those kind of things. It's how you evaluate each thing you're doing in terms of the extent to which it's answering some fundamental question that you hold close to you. Precisely. And obviously that changes to individual because each individual has their own value structure. Well, we talk about this actually on the MBA program. The, the way we approach it is that uh, just because you're human, you, you, you have certain th- questions, you know, certain things that, that we've all evolved to need in, in a way. We have to answer certain fundamental questions, mm-hmm. but then we answer these questions individually in different ways. But it always boils down to some some basic basics which are universal actually you can't pick and choose between them what you can do is pick and choose with with how you go about doing it and what satisfies that and what doesn't and if you can get if you can get back to if you can get back to those basics you've always got an anchor to judge whether or not the thing that you're doing is close to that or not close to that which actually is a very good point bringing us back to right at the beginning with why do people come on an MBA program? A lot of it is to rediscover, uh, the, cheap, the cheap way of saying it is to rediscover their purpose because the word purpose is just too fluffy. I mean, it just doesn't help. But I mean, as, as you've described it like that. Well, it's, it's uh, going back to our definitions of words and vocabulary, purpose is such a loaded term. And <laughs> I think it, it has this somewhat fluffy nature to it. And yeah. language is a very weird thing something i've been discovering at the moment is when you read language there's so much interpretation when it comes to language based on context exactly. trying to trying to get down to the right way to describe a word based on the context is very difficult because there's so many underlying implicit definitions within that main definition that's um, why I, lo- I love doing that i mean i love being i love the precision that language can can bring it's difficult in communication verbal communication the written form has a lot more preciseness to it than than the the oral word does i feel like it's true but then you the way to do that in in spoken word is dialogue that, extended that's you, extended dialogue though because well, you can't the, have it in like five minutes well you if you're being precise you can <laughs> <laughs> you you can cut through in a in a conversation you can cut through things through questions again it comes down better to questions. better questions i was going to say i was going to say it's asking better questions isn't it yeah and that links to loads of other things like what well listening and, and all all, of, all the things that you find on you know on the bookshelf behind you probably lots and lots of things about elements of that but at its core it, it, it its foundation is is the inquiry better questions active listening better better students better mba programs it seems like there's a there's a theme and to be self-reflective i liked in the i liked in the book you talked about the carrying around a notebook mm. i always say to people they should be carrying around notebooks i mean i don't know what i would do without without mine have you found that per, have you found that practice helpful to your students is that what you encourage them to do it, it is what we encourage them to do from day one i i would say the majority probably don't and you can't insist or police 
we, the closest we get is that they have to hand in three reflective assignments in the course of the MBA program. And the way we've constructed those, if you've been writing things down, the whole thing gets super easy or actually not easy so much as deep, <laughs> gets deep quite quickly. If you have not been writing anything down, then it's all your first thoughts that comes across as a draft and it just doesn't, doesn't do it. Do you feel like those individuals that do that practice have a level of clarity and preciseness to their thoughts and what they're writing compared to those individuals? Because that's what I've found in my practice is I'm then able to write more clearly. Yeah. And that's also fair. to express myself. The things that will help you the things that will help you express yourself in writing better is obviously writing and and reading. These are the two the two ways of, of being a better writer. Mm. Yeah, there's no, again, no shortcut. <laughs> yeah, well, there's no shortcut. No, definitely not. I think this has been a very interesting conversation. I've learned a lot. I've, I've, I've really learned a lot. So thank you so much. I think the, a great way to end it, as well as in, obviously encouraging people, if they're interested to do the MBA program, to obviously contact Henley and yourself and also to read your book. I think another one would be as someone who is in the PD space and being a books podcast, I think it will be great to, for you to give some uh, book recommendations for individuals who are looking to perhaps learn more or be more self-reflective. I think a lot of the conversation that we've had is being self-reflective and to enhance that. So perhaps giving some book recommendations on your favorites um, that, that you've read that you that you want to share with with those that are listening or watching. I think that'd be great. Okay, that means right now you want something right now. I want something right now and off the top of your head. Because if you had to prepare, then you'd have to think about it too much. I have been influenced a lot in the, particularly in the writing, but you, also you can listen to him a lot. He's a lot of him on, on YouTube, of the philosopher Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. The British philosopher, yeah. Yeah. I find that has been a source, quite a good source of almost modeling, being precise about an inquiry into the nature of things which tends to be what interests me. I was rereading the other day of a book from the 1960s. This is a career book called The Peter Principle, okay. which is a, it's a humorous book. It's insanely funny. And it's also insanely still true. Uh, it's about the, the nature and structure of uh, organizations and the management of career. Uh, and The Peter Principle is, is a actually a fairly well-known phrase for uh, the idea is 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 that everybody gets promoted to the level of their incompetence in business <laughs> yes <laughs> I, have, I have heard that before yeah is that That's, is that where that derives from that is the peter principle but the book contains dozens of other um, extended and corollaries and uh, all sorts of other rules uh, it's it's very it's eye-opening. The, the other thing I, I, I would recommend for people who may be thinking about type of reading that will hook them into what's going on, particularly in an executive MBA program, and they're very accessible. Uh, there's a series of books called A Very Short, Fairly Interesting and Reasonably Cheap Book on dot, dot, dot. It's always a title. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got one here, actually. And actually, this one is, they're, they're, so they're not thick. Okay. Uh, and they're all titles like that. They all look like, you know, they look like they're dog-eared before you open it. Oh, nice. And um, they are critical introductions, critical as in terms of uh, the, the author is not just presenting the ideas, they're digging behind them for a whole bunch of MBA topics. And I think that's very healthy for someone to have read before, before they do an MBA program or even just, just for, for work to be honest. So those would be three recommendations just off the top of my head. Great ones. I look forward to, I look forward to reading the, uh, the Peter principle. That sounds like something right up my street. Perfect. Uh, yeah. It sounds, I think you, you might well enjoy that one. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait reading it. I uh, can't wait to read it and, and share and share that with you once, once I have, where can uh, individuals who are listening or, or watch this find you? Um, so social or email or LinkedIn uh the yeah my my email at henley is fairly public it's fairly easy to find um twitter i mean you know the usual the usual, the usual, the usual chris, places chris dalton Try, type in chris dalton henley like i did and then it'll come up 
something will come up yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully something related anyway chris thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with with us with me today it was uh, it was thanks to have you on thanks for the invitation i really enjoyed it good questions thanks thank you thank you for listening to this podcast don't forget to like share and subscribe for more content also visit our website www.booktalktoday.com to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value-packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today, for readers, by readers.